the liquid helium has been cooled below the transition temperature of tin. Let us measure the liquid's temperature. To do so, we use an accurate pressure gauge which is connected to the vapor space above the liquid surface in the inner doer. The needle registers the pressure there. It is the saturated vapor pressure of liquid helium. The corresponding liquid temperatures are well known and the gauge is already calibrated in terms of these. The liquid helium is at 1.6 degrees Kelvin. The voltage leads from the tin wire in the doer are connected to the microvoltmeter input. The voltage across it is zero. There is no current in the tin wire. As the current goes to one ampere, there is a sudden voltage surge of about one-tenth of a microvolt, and then the voltage returns to zero. The surge is a small electromotive force due to the self-inductance in the circuit. Breaking the circuit causes the current to collapse and an opposing self-induced EMF as it should. The result important to us here is that after this transient, the potential drop is zero again, while the current is one ampere. Remember that at this current, above the transition temperature, the voltage was 25 millivolts. It is now zero to within the estimated error of this scale, which is about one one hundredth of a microvolt. The voltage across the wire is not more than one hundredth of a microvolt while it is superconducting. Above the transition temperature, it was 25 millivolts. Therefore, the resistance of the wire has dropped on transition by a factor of two and a half million or more. We have fashioned a ring out of tin and placed it into liquid helium. The ring hangs from a thread which provides little torsion. By a simple electromagnetic method, we have induced a current around the ring. To prove the existence of this current, we bring a magnet to the doer. The current in the ring gives it a magnetic moment and it oscillates in the external field of the bar magnet. Remove the magnet and the oscillation disappears. Reverse the bar magnet and the ring turns around. Such current carrying rings of tin or lead have been kept in a cold bath below their transition temperature for months and even years. In all this time, the current kept flowing. By measuring the magnetic field of the current periodically, it was possible to show that the current does not decay measurably at all for periods of years. In this way and in other ways, it has been proved that during the superconducting transition, resistance drops by a factor of 10 to the 20 or more. We now believe the resistance becomes zero. We call this state of the metal superconductivity. The current in the ring is called a persistent current. In our next experiment, we measure the temperature at which tin becomes superconducting. We will use our microvoltmeter to detect the transition. Because it is very sensitive, we need only a small amount of current in the tin wire. And the wire need not be as long as the one which we used before. Two copper leads have again been soldered to each end. One pair carries the current and the other pair is connected to the voltmeter. The tin wire is now in the liquid helium at a temperature of 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Here is a composite picture of our equipment. The current in the wire produces a potential difference. The wire is in the normal state. We are cooling the wire with a vacuum pump as before. The voltage is just now dropping to zero. This is the transition. We are marking the corresponding temperature on the thermometer. Our value for the transition temperature of tin is 3.71 degrees Kelvin. More precise measurements put it at 3.722 degrees.
We've shown that superconductivity is a state of zero electrical resistance, or, to put it the other way around, of infinite conductivity. Although this is remarkable enough by itself, superconductivity is quite a bit more than that, as I mentioned at the start. To show this to you, we now go on to new experiments. They will involve magnetic fields. To begin with, we again measure the transition temperature of tin using the short sample of tin wire. But this time, we've put it parallel to the magnetic field of this electromagnet. For the fields at which we shall be using the magnet, its flux is proportional to the coil current. There is an ammeter in series with the coils. It is already calibrated in terms of the flux density prevailing in the central region between the pole pieces. The field at the wire is 80 Gauss. The same current which we used in the previous experiment is again flowing through the wire and it registers the same IR drop on the microvoltmeter. Clearly, the tin sample is in the normal state, but notice that its temperature is already much lower than 3.71 degrees Kelvin. This was marked off in the previous experiment as our value for the transition temperature of tin in the absence of an external magnetic field. As you can see by the motion of the thermometer needle, the temperature is falling. We are pumping on the liquid helium. Keep your eyes on the microvoltmeter. There. At 80 Gauss, the transition temperature of tin is 3.12 degrees Kelvin. The field is still at 80 Gauss. But the sample has been cooled to 1.5 degrees Kelvin. The sample is superconducting. We are increasing the magnetic field while keeping the temperature fixed. In the neighborhood of 250 Gauss, the field destroys the superconductivity of the sample when its temperature is 1.5 degrees. We call it the critical field for the temperature in question. At fields exceeding the critical value, the superconducting state cannot exist at the given temperature. We have discovered an important property. It is this. Magnetic flux density is a state variable in superconductivity. Let us plot the three transition temperatures and associated critical flux densities. By measurements similar to those we have performed, one finds that the critical flux density depends upon the transition temperature in roughly parabolic fashion. The parabola has its vertex at absolute zero. Points above this curve signify normal, points below it, superconducting states. All superconductors show this type of behavior in magnetic fields. The value of the transition temperature will vary from one material to another. There is a maximum critical field B0 for every superconducting material. At fields whose values lie above B0, superconductivity cannot exist. Below B0, the value of the field strongly affects the transition temperature. 